We have been uh, nibbling our way through Hebrews. I think that's the way of putting it. And uh, let's see here. Let's go back here. Yeah, last week, I've uh, been trying to go through or, or hit chapter 6 in a way, hopefully, that is um, meaningful to each of you. I know that uh, there are aspects of the whole book, because there are five warnings in the book of Hebrews, and they, tend to, they all tend to get our attention. But uh, the, the central one, one you know, number three, is chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. And uh, it's very difficult for many people. I understand why. I'm not saying it's not for me. It's a, it's a tough passage. And, uh, and yet, as much as people often think, and I'll, I'll review that briefly, there are alternate views of what's happening in these verses. And uh, they tend to focus on, or they, they tend to circle around the question of whether one can lose their salvation. And that's an important question, quite obviously. It's an important question for us each to ask. I think one of the dangerous things that people do sometimes, Christians have a tendency, we all have this tendency to do it, we like to live in slogans. So once saved, always saved. So if I just say once saved, always saved, I'm good. So prove it. Um, I'm not saying it's not true. What I'm saying is sometimes we live in the slogan as opposed to the scriptural support for the slogan. And uh, so... So let's do this. Um, you know, he's been leading up to this. We went through chapter 5, and uh, let me just, maybe I'll start reading. He says, um, bah, 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 bah. so he says, I'm in chapter 5. We're just going to go through to get a running jump. And um, he says, uh, speaking of Melchizedek, who we'll touch on tonight if I stop stalling, of whom, verse 11, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. Now, he, whoever you think he, the author is, um, he's, he's a believer, he's a Christian. He's addressing Hebrew Christians, their second generation. This is probably just a couple years before the temple is destroyed. Um, and they're, they're facing um, persecution, they're being ostracized from, by their families, by their society in general, uh, and they're being, uh, they're, uh, you know, they're, the, the temptation is to leave the things of Christ, and, and even in, if in their mind it's like, well, I'm not really leaving the things of Christ, but if I can go along to get along, not, that's probably a new concept to most people in here, right? Um, to go along to get along, then everything will be fine. And he's saying, don't do that. Whatever you do, don't do that. He says, um, I, I want to talk with you about some really important things. He says earlier, he says, by now, you all ought to be teachers. And that principle wasn't only true in 67 AD. It's still true today. No matter what your ethnic background is, you don't have to be Jewish to love Levi's. You don't have to be Jewish uh, to, to be faced with this issue. The point is that anybody who is in Christ, the point is we should be, as, as we walk with him, we should be putting down roots too often in the church. And I know this is not you know, a, a foreign concept to you. Too often in the church, we, we treat our faith in Christ Again, we treat it in cliches. We even say things like, have you come to faith? Wait, wait, wait. PSA. <laughs> Stop saying that. And, and for any of you online who know me and you've heard me say it before, I'm talking to you too. <laughs> Stop saying he came to faith. Everybody has faith. The atheist has faith. Everybody believes something. It's not about coming to faith. It's about being born again. Jesus said to Nicodemus, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. You must be born of water and of the spirit. You must be born again. You're either in or you're out. You're a saint or you're an ain't. That's all there is. That's it. That, there's only two types of people at the end of the day. And in our society, we're such a pluralistic, feel good, don't want to offend anybody kind of a society. And I'm not saying we should be offensive. I'm saying we should be loving and honest about the truth. 
You've been given the truth. I've been given the truth, the responsibility to share the truth of the, of the life-saving gospel of Jesus Christ has not been committed to pastors and missionaries alone. Every single one of us has the responsibility, and we will be held accountable for that at the judgment seat of Christ, for what we did with Jesus Christ. I don't expect to hear one day, well studied, thou good and faithful servant. It's not a question of how much I studied to say something. Well taught, thou good and faithful. No, it's well done. What have we done with our lives? What have you done with your life? What have I done with my life? I'm not responsible for your life in that regard. I am responsible to give you the truth. What you do with it, you'll be accountable for. And uh, yeah, my, so my point in all this is too often, even though I'm sure no one in this room, seriously, would think that we only, we only treat our Christianity as something we do on Sundays and Wednesdays. But each one of us I know, and I'm speaking to me first, each one of us has to ask the question, am I being honest before the Lord with my life? And the Holy Spirit revealed to me the things you want me to change. And if I'm going along to get along, in my family. If I'm going along to get along to please my parents, if I'm going along to get along to look good in front of my kids, if I'm going along to get along because my wife always wants me to go to church, you know, that's bogus. There's nothing to that. It's not even wood, hay, and stubble. Gone. Unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. He says, by now, you ought to be teachers. You ought to know these truths. These things are milk. And the things he describes as milk, we would think, oh, these are things for mature Christians. <laughs> There's an indicator right there of where we are in our understanding of the things of God. So anyhow, he says, verse 11, speaking of Melchizedek, someone who most people never really think of, he says, of whom we have much to say, and these things are hard to explain since you've become dull of hearing. The, the word for dull is sluggish, like lazy, and you can't get it moving. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. You've come to need milk and not solid food. You've been in Christ for years, but you're still sucking on the nipple. You're a baby, is what he's saying. That is not a compliment. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. It makes no difference whether you can thread the needle between Calvinism and Arminianism and talk about, you know, the tulip and all the different things that the theologians love to talk about. There's a whole lot of heat generated more than light. Whole, and, and it happens within the body of Christ in general very often. Everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he's a baby. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, isn't that interesting? These are elementary principles. And, and even in this room, and in, in, in the church in general, probably more than in this room, these things are by no means considered elementary principles. They're considered real, ooh, strong stuff. He's saying those are elementary principles. Leaving the elementary principles of Christ, let's go on to perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, not laying again the foundation of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead, of eternal judgment. And we'll do this, if God permits. For it is, and this is the, the big kahuna, this is the, this, this is the major, this is the major bone in the throat for so many Christians in this passage. Probably the most difficult passage in the New Testament, if not the whole Bible. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, 
It's impossible if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again to themselves the Son of God and they put him to an open shame. So we went over it last week. I'm not going to go back through it again. I really believe this is all rooted in where he begins in chapter 3 of the Kadesh Barnea incident, beginning in verse 7 in chapter 3. Today, he quotes, he quotes Psalm 95. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. He's talking about what happened at Kadesh Barnea. And those people, if you recall, because they resisted God, because they said, we will not go into the promised land, because they were afraid of what was there. God had had enough, and he said, then you won't go in, but you'll die out here in the wilderness. And it's important for us to understand, for the next 38 years, their carcasses fell in the wilderness. Every single day, boom, boom, boom. People were falling to the ground, they were having more funerals. But be careful concluding that they weren't saved. You know, again, we're talking about Hebrews who had been rescued out of slavery in Egypt. And, and you know, now we're looking at the church of Jesus Christ saved by the blood of the Lamb. So it, it feels a little awkward at first to compare those two groups. But they were purchased by their faith in the blood that was put on the lintel of their doors, Right? They were purchased by God. They became a nation that night, God says. They were his. He purchased them. So if he purchased them, when he said, you're not going into the promised land, he didn't say you're going to hell. We make the mistake of thinking because they, their carcasses fell in the wilderness, they went to hell. That's not what happened. They lost the blessing, and so they lost their lives, their physical lives, not their spiritual destiny, Okay. And he's drawing a comparison between what happened in Kadesh Barnea and for the next 38 years until their children went into the promised land. He's drawing a comparison between that and Christians today who resist the Spirit of God. But do take note that when he says it's impossible in these, in these three verses, it's three verses, one sentence, it's impossible for a certain type of of people. Who are these people? Or how, who is this person? Someone who has five qualifications, it says. The five qualifications are someone who were once enlightened, who've tasted the heavenly gift, who become partakers of the Holy Spirit, who've tasted the word of God and, the, and who've tasted of the powers of the age to come. It's impossible for that class, if you would, that class of people, that group of people, that kind of group. It's impossible for them, if they're to fall away, to renew them again to repentance. So we, we left it there last time. Uh, I went through, you know, what are the typical, I'm not going to do it again, there's six different views of this, and because of, you know, Christians say this all the time. I know, you know, those of you who are going to go to Israel with us, you'll hear it a lot. Two Jews, three, three opinions. Um, yeah, Gentile Christians are, are really no better. And so, I mean, when you get six alternating views of what do, what, is, what do those three verses mean, and then you get 16 alternates that come out of those, like, <laughs> they got nothing on us. So, um, in any event, after he said all of that, by the way, I, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave you with this as we move on to the rest of the passage. He says, verse six, it's impossible for that class of people, if they are to fall away, to renew them again to repentance. Why? Since they crucify again to themselves, the son of God, and they put him to an open shame. My question for you is, it's just a homework assignment. I think you should check it out. Just a homework assignment, and I think you should check it out. Now, it's only a homework assignment, and I think you should check it out. Some of you will never touch it. I just know that's the way people are. I can ask people ahead of time, are you going to read this? And, and 16 people are going to put up their hands, yes, and I'll ask next week, and one person might meekly say, I tried to read it. So anyhow, I'm not mocking. I'm just saying that's the way we are. You know, we forget. The question is, whose repentance is he talking about? Is he speaking of a person like you or me? Or is he speaking of God himself? 
That's not the way we would typically look at it, and I'm not saying I'm right. That I'm not. It's just an idea, because when you study certain things, example, Esau, when we, in fact, I think we'll touch on Esau later on in this passage in, in chapter 6. Esau, what did he do? He sold his birthright, right? For some stew. And God was unrepentant when, when Esau said, can I have it back? God was unrepentant. We use repentance in our mind. We use repentance in terms of turning from sin. Metanoia is the Greek word. You find it in the New Testament. It means to change, to turn, all right? But we use it in the context of uh, for, you know, confession, repentance from a life of sin. We use it that way. So to think of God repenting. How can God repent? It just means change of mind. So God will not repent. But how could he? So then, it may be, and I'm just saying, just test it out. Over the course of the next week, look it up. See how it works for you. You might find it interesting, and I'll leave it there. Anyhow, and, I'm sorry. I, I'm not leaving you hanging. I left you an assignment. <laughs> I'm not, you think I'm going to give you answers all the time? No, I, sometimes I ask questions, and then you've got to figure it out from there. Yeah. Um, anyhow, it's impossible for them, for that group of people, that if, he says, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance. Who's repentance? Because they crucify again to themselves the Son of God, and they put him to an open shame. How is that? Here's an example. He says, for the, for the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it, and bears herbs that are useful for those by whom it's cultivated, receives blessing from God. By the way, Rocky, did you notice we're not in chapter 7 yet, and we didn't study this last week. That's a shot, wasn't it? <laughs> no, it's just an observation. Yes, anyhow. I'm writing notes. For, <laughs> for the earth, for the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it's cultivated, receives blessing from God, right? Blessing from God in the earth that bears good things. But if it bears thorns and briars, it's rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. See, when we use words like curse and burn, we're, we're conditioned to think hell. Burn hell, burn hell, you know, because no one wants to be burned, and Christians never want to talk about being burned. I think I mentioned last week, Jesus uses that, actually he used it a few times, but in, keep your place, but in, in John 15, abide in me, and I'll abide in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and they throw them into the fire and they are burned. Burned. We think hell. Why? Consider the context in which Jesus is speaking here. Is he speaking about heathen? He's saying, he's giving instruction to his followers. Look at the next, in verse 8 of, of Hebrews 6. If it bears thorns and briars, it's rejected, near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. Think of the four soils for a moment. We all know the parable. The sower and the four soils, right? One sower... Who's the sower? Jesus. Son of God. What's the seed? Word. Word of God. And as the sower walks along, he sows you know, the old way as it is really in many you know, uh, third world countries today. Just scattering from a bag, scattering. Some falls on the path. And the birds of the air come along, snatch it up. It never has a chance to take root. Some falls on rocky soil, so it's shallow, and it begins to germinate. But as the sun comes up, 
there's not enough moisture in the soil, and even though it's germinated, it dies off. It can't really put down a, a real taproot. And then, of course, there's the third soil, which, in which the, it, it germinates, it puts forth sprout, and actually the way he says it, I think it's in Mark 4 he says it this way, it, because of the, because of the thorns and the thistles, the, the weeds that are in the soil, it fails to bring forth fruit. In fact, the, the, the sense that you get is it once did, but then stops. And then, of course, there's what's called the good soil, in which it germinates, it put, puts down a, a root, it puts up a sprout, and it bears fruit some, some 30, 60, 100 fold. So now if the soils are people, which one's saved? Which one's saved? It's not a, it's not a test, it's not a, it's not a trick question. Which one, which one, which person, which, which is the saved person? Excuse me, which is the saved person? That wasn't even Hebrew. Huh? Which I, someone speak louder. One at a time is better, probably. <laughs> Which one? The good soil is a saved person. Okay, what about the third person? The third soil. I think so. Okay, now we're going to take votes. <laughs> All right. You see, the point is, at, at some point, at, we, the, the, the thorns and the thistle, thistle, the thistle, that's what they need for me to say. I don't know about you, but it's, they represent what? The cares of the world? The thorns and the thistles represent what? The cares of the world? Do you have cares of the world in your life? Do they choke out the life in you? Are you unsaved? Okay, so then, let's be careful how we view that third soil. And my point here is that we can get into our Christian formulas pretty quickly if we're not careful. In fact, sometimes, I, this is just an alternate view, and I'm not, I'm not all about alternate views, I'm just saying. Over the years, as I've looked at this parable, some of you are thinking, would you just teach Hebrews? But I've looked at that parable, and I've looked at myself, and thought, I am all four soils. I was that first soil. And I was that second soil, more than I would like to admit. And that third soil, boy, my life has been consumed by the cares of the world. Money, stuff, we all got it. Your washing machine breaks down, that's a care of the world, and suddenly everything is focused on repairing that. Especially you've got kids, you've got mounds of laundry all of a sudden. Flat tire, cares of the world. You know, we all got them. So let's not associate that stuff always with sin. And even sin itself can consume our lives, it doesn't mean we've lost our salvation. I know that everybody know, here knows that. My point is, there are some interesting parallel truths that are taught throughout the Bible that agree with what we're reading here. It's not a loss of salvation, it's a loss of blessing, because we're focused on these other things. Let's keep going. But beloved, and I like this, verse nine, we are confident, that's a strong word, we are confident of better things concerning you, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. Why is he confident? Why do you think he's confident of better things concerning them? Why do you think he's confident of better things concerning them? He knows them. Why is he confident of better things concerning them? Is he just selling them? Hey, come on, keep going like the coach. Coach Paul, come on, keep going. Is that what he's doing? What's he doing? I'm, we're confident of better things concerning you. Why is he confident? What? Why is he confident of better things concerning them? He knows them. Why is he confident of better things concerning these people he knows? Huh? He free. Well, because they're saved. We're confident of better things concerning you, things con con concerning salvation. 
though we speak in this manner. Because God's not unjust, he says. We're not un- God's not unjust to forget your work and your labor of love, which you've shown toward his name, in that you've ministered to the saints, and you do minister. Look, you've got a good track record. You've been, you, you came to the Lord, you've been growing in the Lord, you've been walking with the Lord, and now you're up against an obstacle. And the obstacle of your family, or it's, it's the priesthood and all these people who see you on the streets and they hate you because you're following that weird itinerant rabbi from the Galilee. And they're saying, turn or burn. You're going to keep going that way. You're out of Israel completely. Maybe you've been cut off already. He's saying, we're confident of better things toward you. Because God's not unjust. He knows you. You're saved. You're saved. You can't lose your salvation. I think I said it last week. If that passage, if that passage, I think I read to you 12 verses, and you could come up with another dozen, two or three dozen verses that that support the same truth, which is that if you're in Christ, you can't fall out of Christ because he's the one who has saved you. It's not a matter of having a label. It's a matter of being born again. And if you're born again, you can't become unborn again. So, if that's true, then if those three verses support the idea that a true Christian can lose their salvation, then those three verses contradict all of the scripture. So that can't be the, what it's saying, right? And he continues on. Everything he's saying is supporting that view. God's not unjust. God's not unjust to forget your work, your labor of love that you've shown toward his name because you've ministered to the saints and you continue to do that. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full full assurance of hope until the end so that you do not become sluggish, but rather that you imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. All he's saying, it sounds, the, the language is heavy. I, I grant you that. And in some ways it's it, it, not clumsy, but it can be complicated. But what he's saying is, keep on. Don't get bogged down in the stuff of the world. Don't get bogged down in all these things that distract you, including the persecution. That's tough stuff. It's, 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 it's real easy for people sitting in America in our comfy chairs and all that to say, oh, they shouldn't do that. Well, <laughs> we just haven't experienced it yet then. But it's coming. I guarantee you it's coming. Not because of the results of this election. But it's coming. It's coming to American church. And you're going to see a great number of people who have called themselves Christians turn away. Because what they considered Christianity That was comfortable, and uncomfortable can't be God. And they'll turn for various reasons. That was too simple a way of putting it. So he says, don't become sluggish. Keep on, because the blessing comes. And the rewards, remember, that's, that's where we ended up last week. It's about the rewards that are available to us. Those rewards are for us after we leave this earth, at the judgment seat of Christ. For when God made a promise to Abraham, now you've got to follow this through because this, uh, this is where it really the rubber really starts to meet the road here. When God made a promise to Abraham, because he, God, could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. People say that stuff all the time. Ah, I swear to God. I sw- uh, yeah, I swear to God. You know, let me some money. I, I swear on my mother's grave. You know, I, I'll do this. People always swear by someone greater. Someone's got to swear to God, swear to God all the time to, for you to lend him money. You shouldn't lend him any money. Because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself saying, surely in blessing I will bless you and in multiplying I will multiply you. Now we said that in Genesis chapter 22. We can look it up, but it's a, in the interest of time, I want to keep going forward. Do you recall when God made his promise to Abraham the first time you read it? Do you recall when that is? How old was Abraham when God made his promise to Abraham? When God made his promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, how old was Abraham? When God made his promise to Abraham, when he was in Ur of the Chaldees, and he left there, 
and he went to Haran, and then God called him a second time and said, now, come on, after his father died. He said, follow me, and I will make you a nation. I will make you into a nation. How old was Abraham? 30? 25? 40? 90? No, younger. How old was he? Come on, it's in the Bible. It's the first book of the Bible. There you go, 75 years old. And he was, Avram was his name, which means exalted father. Now how about that for a joke to, to wear through life? Never had a kid, and he was married to, yeah, everybody laughed at him. Especially because his wife was barren. God said, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a son. Promised him a son. By the way, how many years went by before Isaac, Isaac was born? How many years went by? Huh? 25 years. He was 100 when Isaac was born. Now they tried to help God in the process, right? Sarah says, take my son, or take my, my handmaid. Take my handmaid and lie with her. Okie doke, huh? And, and he did, Right? Bad move. I mean, Abraham made some dumb moves. By the way, this is important. This is all part of Hebrews. He made some pretty dumb detours along the way, didn't he? Did he lose his salvation? Actually, and was Abraham saved? How do you know that? Where would you find it in the Bible that Abraham was saved? Well... He didn't live in Hebrews 11. So where do you find it in the Bible that Abraham was saved? Where do you find it in the Bible? Not, don't, uh, don't, give me a, don't give me a sentence. Where do you find it? See, it's important for Christians to know where to find these things. It's right there. It's in the 15th chapter. In fact, it's verse 6. Abraham believed God. The reason this is important is the apostle Paul drums and drums and drums and drums and drums this point in Romans to show that you and I are saved by the same faith that Abraham exercised. Abraham, Genesis 15, verse 6, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. He didn't do something, he believed. Didn't Jesus say something like that? What's the work that God requires of us? What did Jesus say? The work that God requires is to believe. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. How many years went by? From the time that God made the promise to the exalted father. Actually, it was fewer years. I think it was 23 years or 24 years when God changed his name from Avram, exalted father, to Avraham, which if the first one was a bad joke, the second one was worse. Avraham father. means father of a multitude. It went from exalted father, no kids, to father of a multitude. How do you want to walk through life with that handle? See, these are real people, real stories. We can look back at them and it sound like fables to us, but it's real stuff. Now, I'm not just talking. There's a point in here I want to get to. And the point is, it's too easy because people have made us feel like, well, these verses make it sound like you lose your salvation if you don't do this, this, and that. And, and the Father is this taskmaster. Do this, do this. No, he's, he's God the Father. Right? He's not the Godfather. He's God our Father. And he's a loving Father. Once you're saved, he still, he loves you. He's, he's, he's pushing you. He's prompting you because he wants to reward you. When God made a promise to Abraham, verse 13, because he couldn't swear by anybody else, he swore by himself saying, surely blessing I will bless you, multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, Abraham patiently endured with a lot of dumb detours in the process. For 25, count them, for 25 years. I, I, <laughs> clearly, he's a much better man than me. But 25 years, I don't know, I think. It's not like he had the body of Christ around him, spurring him on. 
Wouldn't it have been a whole lot easier just to say, <laughs> I, I must have been bad shawarma that I ate. I mean, like, <laughs> how did this happen? What, what was I thinking? After he patiently endured those 25 years, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for, is for them an end of all dispute. And so God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, to show the immutability of his counsel, he confirmed it by an, earth, by an oath. <coughs> wow, wait a minute. Okay, wait, let me finish the thought. God confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it's impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us by two immutable things. What things? By his word and by his oath, God confirmed this to Abraham. Incidentally, after Abraham believed, and I, I'm... I didn't expect to spend all this time in Genesis tonight, but I, I, this, I think this is really important for us to get. Abraham believed God, Genesis 15, verse 6, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. We would use the terminology today, righteousness was imputed to him. We use it this way. When you're born again, when you were born again, your righteousness still means nothing at all. It's the righteousness of Christ, the Bible says, that has been accounted to you, literally imputed to you, poured into your account. It's like you wake up tomorrow morning and you have a billion dollars in your account. That'd be nothing compared to the righteousness of Christ, even though you think that'd be really cool. And you'd probably go bankrupt. But after that same passage, after, in that same chapter, God does something. And it's worthwhile on your own to just sit and study it. And I'm just describing it because it'll take too long to read through the whole thing. What God does is that he tells Abraham, now go and get these animals. Get this heifer, get this goat, get these doves, cut them in half. Yet we read it. It's a bloody mess. That is a bloody mess. And put them out side by side. It doesn't mean much to us because it's so countercultural for us. But in that day, that's how, you would, that's how you would make a covenant with someone. In fact, it was literally called cutting a covenant. You cut the animals. I think that's where we get cut the deal from. You'd cut the animals in half. You'd lay them out one side to another. And then the two parties making the deal would walk in a figure, figure eight between all those pieces and say to the other, should I not keep my end of the deal? May what happened to these animals then happen to me. Okay, that's, that's a covenant. And you, in the modern translations, you don't usually see the word cut, but in Hebrew, it's almost always there. They cut a covenant. In this case, God tells him to do this. Abraham falls into this, I don't want to call it a trance, but he, he falls into this dark funk. It's scary for him. And he sees this smoking fire pot, God himself, walking between the pieces. God called Abraham to cut the animals, but Abraham never walked between the pieces. God walked between the pieces. God made the covenant. God saying, I'll keep the covenant. That's an immutable, remember the word? That means unchangeable. It's an immutable covenant from an immutable God to Abraham. That's how sure Abraham could then be that God was going to keep the deal. And that is an example of how sure you can be because it was the father, Isaiah chapter 53 says, the Lord, it pleased the Lord to crush his son for you. That's literally what it says. It pleased him to crush him for us. God did that because there's no way you and I could ever keep this deal, this salvation. But God did it, proving that you can't lose what he's done. 
You can't lose what he has done. So we have this hope, verse 19. After all of that, and I know it sounds like a lot of wandering, but we have this hope as an anchor for our soul, sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, that is Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. An anchor. I used to spend a lot of time, especially living in Long Island, and then when I was a teenager, I'd go down the shore, go out at, you know, Brielle or some of these other places, go fishing, go on fishing boats, stuff like that. But we had our own boat for a while. Especially when, you know, you're out at the Jersey Shore, you're in Long Island Sound. You put down an anchor, you don't see that anchor much more than about eight inches from the water level because it's just murk. And you put down this anchor, and it might be 80 feet down by the time the anchor hits. And with all the, the, the movement of the tide and the currents and all that, you know that you're moving, but then you feel it go, it catches on to something. You have an anchor for your boat that anchors you to that rock or whatever it is down there. You can't see it, but you trust the anchor that's grabbed a hold of whatever it is there down the bottom. But this isn't that kind of an anchor. This is an anchor for our souls. It doesn't anchor us to the murk. It doesn't anchor us to a rock under the water. It doesn't anchor us to the earth. It anchors us upward, not downward. You think of most of the things we do in our lives. Most of the things we do in our lives are intended to anchor us downward. Our jobs, our profession, our education, our investments, all these things. We're anchoring ourselves downward. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong. Because there's things we've got to do in our lives. But most of the things we do are designed to anchor us to something we, we can be sure about in this world. I don't know what you can really be sure about, except that everything's going to fail at some point. So we put out lots of anchors. If this fails, we got another anchor. But we have this truth as an anchor for our souls. It's, it's sure, it's steadfast. And it's anchored upward, behind the veil. No, you can't see what's going on up there, but we're anchored to him. It's upward. This is the basis of faith. We go through, we go through life as Christians and we think, oh, faith, i got to believe, i got to believe. Well, what are you believing in? For as much as many of us as Christians know about the Scripture, so much of our faith is, if we're honest, it's faith in faith. I, I just got to believe. I just got to believe. No, believe in what the Word of God has said. If we believe in the things the Word of God has said, and read through the Scripture, when a prophet comes on the scene and says something, he's saying, he's saying something or speaking something forth based upon what the Word of God. Remember, we studied Elijah. And, and he comes to Ahab, and he says, before the Lord, according to the Lord, before whom I stand, no more rain. Why does he say that? Because he felt like, you know, you know what, I'll show you. And he could just speak for God? No, God had promised back in the Torah that when Israel begins to go after idols, these are the things that will happen, and one of them will be no rain. So he could say it on the basis of what God's word had said. And in the same way, we can believe that God will do or not do certain things in our life on the basis of what his word said, not on how, ooh, ooh, sure, ooh, I can really believe this. No, it's on the basis of what his word said. And so we have this hope as an anchor for our souls, sure and steadfast, and, 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 it's, and, and it goes to his presence behind the veil, his presence behind the veil. That's how we get through life. We're the forerunner. Jesus is our forerunner. And he's already entered behind there on our behalf. And we'll find out later that he continues to intercede for us while we're going through the struggles of life. 
but that he's become high priest forever. Remember, the, these are terms that a lot of times, as, especially as Gentile Christians, we're not used to using. I mean, we, I, I think in this room, we, we understand who the high priest was and that sort of thing. But he's speaking to a Jewish audience here. And now he's going to say some things to them which are really going to rock their world. He says that this one, Jesus, has become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now remember, there's no chapter breaks. This is not written with chapter breaks. He just continues to move through. He says, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of El Elyon, Mosai God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither become, or oh, excuse me, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now, I, I read those three verses, but there's a lot packed in there. All right, let's, uh, let's do this. Let's go over to Genesis chapter 14. Melchizedek. Not, uh, not a person that most of us actually think about very much. Probably, maybe you do. I don't think most people do. Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Made of two words. If you don't know Hebrew, you might know it because he's, he's a famous guy. And made of two words. Melech means king in Hebrew. Tzedek, like T-S. Not Zedek with a Z, but a T-S. Tzedek. T-S-E-D-E-K. That's kind of how you'd spell it. King, Melech, king. There's no word for of in Hebrew. Tzedek, righteous or righteousness. So he's Melech Tzedek, Melchizedek, means king of righteousness. He was also king of a city that was not yet called Jerusalem. At the time, it was probably called Yebus, Jebus, which later on, when it's conquered, uh, becomes Yerushalayim, or Jerusalem. It basically means Jerusalem is made up of two words, far more information than you cared about. But anyhow, uh, Yerushalayim, means city of, can you hear it in there? You hear shalayim. That sounds like shalayim. But anyhow, you hear it? Shalom. You hear shalom in that? Okay. So, ir shalom. Yer shalayim. That's basically what it means. So it's the city of peace. Um, Melchizedek is called king of righteousness, but he's also the king of, at that time, 2,000 years before Christ, roughly, is Abraham in Genesis 14, about 2,000 years. So maybe we're talking 400 years, 350. I, I should have checked it out tonight. Um, 350 to 400 years since the flood. So this, this, is, this is murky stuff, okay? It's kind of like, wait, wait, what's happening here? So there's a lot of, there are a lot of things that people think about Melchizedek. Um, maybe we'll dispel some of them. So anyhow, there was war, right? You remember what happened? Uh, Abraham... He shouldn't have brought Lot with him, but anyhow, he did. And after he'd brought Lot from Ur, the Chaldees, and they've come around, and they've come into, the, into Canaan, and then they go down uh, into Egypt, and the whole lie about, you know, Sarah, uh, she's really my sister. Um, and then they come back really blessed. Abraham has been blessed. He's been given all of these cattle, and because and, and, the Pharaoh just wanted to bless them and get them out of there. And... Um, you know, what was it? Who was it who used to teach that? Um, but anyhow, he used to say, can you imagine what that chariot ride was like on the way back from Egypt? Yeah. Abraham and Sarah. Like, well, look, hon, I mean, look at, look at all this cattle. Look at how rich we are. It's like, that was a very quiet ride. Um, you said that I was your sister and that you put me, anyhow. Um, and Lot also came back, also blessed. And their herds grew so immensely, they got to the point, that's chapter 13, where Lot and Abraham meet. Abraham says, look, just look north, south, east, west. 
You pick what you want and you take it. I'll, whatever you don't take, I'll take. So he allows Lot to choose what he wants. Lot looks to the cities of the plain, Sodom, Gomorrah, Zeboim, Zoar, those places. And he says, that looks great. So he, he set his tent toward Sodom. And of course, the rest of the story about Sodom is he set his tent toward Sodom. Then he moved into Sodom. He actually became a city councilman in Sodom. And then Sodom, you could say, moved into him. Um, and yet he's still considered righteous, by the way. That's an interesting story. He never lost his salvation. Anyhow, he, uh, but when hard times came, this is the dangerous part when you walk on the wild side, when you decide to mix it up on the border. When hard stuff came, when the four kings made war from Persia, Shinar, which is Babylon, basically, I mean, really, it's kind of like the four kings represent the four forces of earth at that time. You can make the case, but not tonight. They came against the five kings of these five little cities. And when they did that, they eventually took everything. Twelve years, verse 4, it says, verse 14, 12 years, they served Cheddar Lamer, he was the big cheese. Uh, in the 13th year, they rebelled. In the 14th year, Cheddar Lamer and the kings that were with him came and they attacked. Look at who they attacked. They attacked the Rephaim, the Zuzim, the Emim, and the Horites. Now you're thinking to yourself, ah, who cares? They're giants. These kings attacked the giants, Nephilim, the giants. These are different breeds of the giants, but that's a study for another time. They attacked them and they won as far as El Paran. Then they turned back, verse seven, they came to Mishpat, which is Kadesh by Kadesh Barnea. And they attacked all the country of the Amalekites and they also the Amorites who dwelt in Hazazon Tamar and the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, the king of Bela, which is Zor, went out, they joined together in the battle in the valley of Sidim against Chedorlaomer, the king of Elam, against Tidal, the king of the, of the, of the Goyim, the uh, Gentiles, basically the nations, Amraphel, the king of Shinar, or Babylon, Ariok, the king of Eleazar, Eleazar, four kings against five, and the valley of Sidon was full of asphalt pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell there, the remainder fled to the mountains. Then they, the four kings, took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, they took all of their provisions, and they went their way. They also made a really big mistake. They took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom. They took him and his goods, and they departed. Then one who had escaped came and told of Ram, the Hebrew. By the way, you make a note in your Bible if you would. You don't have to. But uh, in Hebrew it says, because Abraham wasn't called the Hebrew. That's, that's a transliteration, okay? They called him a Havru, Haviru. Haviru, it means a wanderer. And, and that's where you get the name. That's the only place you're going to find it in the Bible. That's where you get the word Hebrew from. Uh, in English, I would say H-A-B-I-R-U. The B is more like a V, Haviru. For he dwelt by the terebin trees of the Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshkol, the brother of Anur, blah, blah, blah. Now, when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 300, follow this closely, because I don't know how you read the Bible, but here's a guy we tend to look at him as, well, you know, he's got some goats. <laughs> he's got 318 trained servants. Well, how many servants do you think he had total? There were 318, and these guys are studs. This is like SEAL Team 6. This, this is Delta Force. These guys are going to follow after and chase down these kings. They're going to they're beat the snot out of them. Sorry if that was too much for you. But anyhow, this is important. Follow this now. This dude is heavy. He's wealthy. Abraham is one wealthy dude. In Hebrew, he's havod. I mean, he's heavy. That's, what, that's how they say, oh, he's a heavy man. It doesn't mean he's fat. It means he's heavy. He's loaded. Yeah, we get loaded. He's heavy. You, you think I'm joking. No, that's really what it would say in Hebrew. Okay. And um, 
318 trained servants. Trained for what? Trained for war, dude. I mean, that's what they were trained for. They were born in his house. He didn't hire them. And they went in pursuit as far as Dan. He's down in Beersheba. He's in uh, Glassboro, New Jersey. And he went up, not as far as Albany, but pretty good distance. They got cooking. They went all the way up to a place called Dan. Now, some of you have been to Israel. Some of you will go to Israel. You recall when Dan got their allotment, they were supposed to be on the Mediterranean. They didn't like it there because they couldn't handle the Philistines. So they sent out spies. They found a city up in one of the most drop-dead beautiful areas you're going to find in Israel. And you'll see it if you're going with us. It was called Lish. And they said, this is a great place. We should go. So they went, and they killed everybody who was there. It was the worst thing they could have done, but they did it. And they took that area called Laish, the city of Laish. You can see it today. You see the ruins of it today. They took it, and that became Dan. Dan was supposed to be on the Mediterranean. They were all the way up in the north. The writer, Moses, is telling us, based upon what's going to happen in the future, where they went. So these studs, this delta force, went all the way up there to get Abraham's nephew back. Think about that. What a picture God will do for those he loves. Went and pursued as far as Dan. By the way, when you go there, it's interesting. I, I'm not, this is not... I'm not, this is not tourist stuff. I'm, this is so fascinating to me every time I go there. Because what else happens in Dan? We've been reading it in the Kings. What happened? Well, what kind of idol worship? Who the golden calf? Jeroboam. Two altars, one in Bethel and the other in Dan. You go there, you're going to see the altar where the golden calf was set up. And they go up there. He divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants, he didn't just send some mercenaries up there. Abraham went. Abraham went. This is not some 30-year-old guy. How old do you think Abraham is here in chapter 14? I guess he's around 85. Yeah. And he and his servants attacked them. They pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. That's a good hike. And so he brought back all the goods. Abraham did this. What do you think he looked like? Probably took a shower before he came back, right? <laughs> Covered with dirt. I mean, you don't ride on camels and, and all this and do that kind of war without getting a little messy. Right? He's not working with drones. You understand? Okay? This is with knives and spears and arrows. Okay, you with me? Yeah. Abraham, our father Abraham, bloody, messy, Dirty. He did this. I love how, you know, men sometimes will read the Bible and say, oh, I don't understand it. You know, girls like this stuff. These are men's men. I love, this is what I love about the word of God. This, and you look at Jesus Christ. You know, he's a carpenter. And most carpenters in his day, they didn't really work with wood. Most of the wood had already been stripped out of the promised land or, or of Israel in those days. They were also stonemasons. Jesus was a stonemason. He didn't have a six pack. He had an eight pack. This was a man. You know, he, if he did cut down a tree, he didn't go to Lowe's or Home Depot to get his wood. He'd strip, he, he'd rip the wood himself and, and he'd build. I mean, he was a man's man. All these guys are real men. And so Abraham, 85-year-old Abraham and his 318 trained men go up and they, they whoop these guys. And so, verse 16, he brought back all the goods. And he brought back his brother Lot and his goods, as well as the women and the people. You got to see him coming back. Probably a little tired. With all these camels and all these guys. Victors. Yeah. Dirty. Bloody. <laughs> we have so sanitized this stuff. You got to get, you got to smell it. Yeah. Blood doesn't smell great after a couple days. <laughs> this is a mess but they're victors. They're victors. He came back. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shaveh, which is the king's valley. 
after his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him. But also Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out, ooh, what is that? Bread and wine. Now, this is not communion, right? This is not in remembrance of Christ. But it is interesting when you read through the scripture that when you see bread and wine, take note. Law of first mention. God places these ideas. By the way, Joseph was in prison, right? Uh-huh. Who was he in prison with? A baker and a what? A wine steward. Interesting when you see these little types that the Holy Spirit lays out for you in preparation for the one who's coming because this Melchizedek, oh, I got to go fast, but I, I, anyhow. Um, so who is this Melchizedek becomes the question. Melchizedek, king of Salem, peace, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of El Elyon in, in Hebrew. It's the only time you find that is, is there. And uh, who was it? What's her name? The, um, the, the Christian singer. Who said, who, Amy? Amy Grant, El Elyon. She's the only one I know who ever uses that term. El Elyon. El Elyon Adonai. Yeah. Um, he was the priest of God most high, and he blessed him. Who blessed? Abraham blessed Melchizedek, right? You're not paying attention. You're just waiting for me to say something. You're not reading your Bible. Melchizedek blessed Abram. Melchizedek blessed Abram. And he blessed him, and he said, Blessed be Avram of El Elyon, of God Most High, who's the possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be El Elyon, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, Abraham, gave him, Melchizedek, a tithe of all. He paid him a tithe. That's the first time you're going to read tithe in the scripture. We tend to associate the tithe with the law of Moses. But that hasn't happened yet. That's not going to happen to chapter 20 of Exodus. That's not going to happen for another 600 years. This is the first time you see tithe. It's not the first time tithes ever happen. It's the first time you're going to read about tithe in the scripture. If you follow the idea of the law of first mention, and if you're not familiar with that, basically what it means, it's not a law. It's people call it a law. But when you're studying the Bible, it's interesting to observe when God uses a concept the first time in Scripture. Because very often, the circumstances in which he uses the concept tend to color the meaning of the idea he's introduced. So that as time goes on, it develops from there. For example, Genesis 22, uh, God says to Abraham, after Isaac is probably about 30 years old, that makes Abraham 130 years old. Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Whom you love. That's the first time you find love in the scripture. Uh, it's very interesting. I, I can't do this. And so, so Abraham paid the tithe of all that he had, of all the plunder that he brought. He brought plunder. You think these guys didn't plunder those kings? You bet they did. They killed them and they plundered them. And the king of Sodom said to Avram, give me the, it says persons here, but in Hebrew, give me the souls. The king of Sodom said, give me the souls. And you think of what Sodom is, therefore what it represents. So the king of Sodom is saying, give me the souls, like the devil, saying, give me the souls. And you take the goods for yourself. But Avram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to Jehovah El Elyon, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say that I have made Avram rich, except only what the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men who went with me, honor Eshkel Mamre, and let them take their portion. Okay, so uh, really, uh, we're going to end. I'm sorry to keep you so long. But anyhow, so that's the basic. We'll get back to it next time. That's the, the basic part of Melchizedek. So here's this one we read about. I'm in Hebrews, so and we're going to end. But I just got to find a place to do that. Um, so he says in verse 2, to whom Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, to whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, but also translated 
king of Salem or king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the son of God, remains a priest continually. Now listen, the writer of Hebrews is not saying that Melchizedek had no father or mother. He's not saying that he was never born or that he never died. He's not saying that. He's saying the scripture doesn't tell us this. Look, the Genesis is full of genealogies. Some people say, well, who's, because everybody asks, who's Melchizedek? Some people say, well, it's Shem, because Noah had three sons, Ham, Shem, Japheth. Shem's still alive. You go back to Genesis 10, the genealogy, Shem is clearly still alive. But he, there's no basis to assume that this one is Shemitic. There's no connection to Shem because it wouldn't agree with the genealogy that's there in chapter 10. And so his point is, the writer is, his point is, I gotta just say it quick and we'll come back to it next time. He, what he's saying is, this one is, he, we are not given any reference to say this was his father, this was his mother, this is when he was born, this is when he was taken out of this world. We're not told anything about it. His point is, the writer's point is, he becomes a type for us of Jesus Christ. Some people want to say this is a theophany, fancy $50 word or Christophany of a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ. And yet, it's not a pre-incarnate um, appearance because he, he appears here, he's referred to a number of times. He doesn't just show up on the, the scene and have nothing to do with anything else, which would be a theophany, a Christophany, where it appears and goes. No, he's a, a solid human being. But he is typological. He's, or typical would be the word, of Christ. And, and makes his point to say, he's talking about a different kind of priesthood. Remember his audience, his audience are Jews. So a priest is a Kohen, a priest, comes from the tribe of Levi. And now he's going to say, this priest, Melchizedek, has no roots in Levi. And Christ is a high priest forever, but he's not a Levite. In fact, he comes from a tribe that the Bible says nothing about as it pertains to priests, which is Judah. So Christ is of a different order of priests altogether, a, a priesthood according to the priesthood of Melchizedek. And, and he makes the point, and you kind of have to think like a rabbi, which is not something easy for everybody, but his point is that Abraham, who he's not the first Jew, but we'll call him the first Jew, okay, paid tithes to this one. So that therefore Levi must have paid tithes. You're thinking, no, no, Abraham did. No, Abraham, Levi was in Abraham's loins, he'll say. So therefore, Levi paid tithes to Melchizedek. Some of you are thinking, okay, I need coffee. <laughs> yeah. And I know you do, so we're going to pray. So why don't we stand?